According to the Pew Research Center, the Asian American population has nearly doubled from 2000 to 2019, making it the fastest growing race or ethnicity in the United States. Asians now make up around 7% of the nation's population, and that number is projected to increase a lot during the next few decades. Of course, minority groups of all types in the United States face unique challenges. So what are those unique challenges specifically for Asian Americans? And of course, what can be done to ensure that Asian Americans have the support and the resources they need to live healthy lives? Hello there, this is Bradley. And you're listening to Psych Everywhere, a podcast by Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. For this show, distinguished guests weigh in on applying psychological science to a diverse range of current events and to better your life. This episode was made possible through a special Psychi sponsorship with CSPP Alliant International University. If you'd like to learn about graduate programs at CSPP, be sure to check out the link in the show notes for this episode. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Michi Fu, who earned her PhD at, you know, surprise, surprise, CSPP Alliant International University. And in fact, she earned her PhD there with an emphasis in multicultural community clinical psychology. Dr. Fu is a professor of clinical psychology at CSPP, and also a visiting professor of National Taiwan University. She's taught a lot of courses such as cultural immersion, experience in Taiwan mental health related cross-cultural perspectives, and intercultural process and human diversity. She also has a part-time private practice to support Taiwan and Mandarin speaking people. An expert in advocacy and Asian American mental health, Last but not least, she also consults with the Garfield Health Center to serve lower income people. Dr. Fu, welcome to Psych Everywhere. Thanks so much for having me, Bradley. Oh, I'm so happy to have you on the show. So this week I've been just scrambling because we're going to Disney World next week. Oh. And I'm really excited, but a lot of things needed to get done. (laughs) Say hi to Minnie Mouse for me. I love her. (laughs) I I will do it. (laughs) My little boy's excited. So. I've just been scrounging to get through all these projects. And so when I saw that you had booked this interview, this is Friday, four o'clock, end of the week. And I thought, yes, this is how I want to end my week is doing a nice, lovely podcast conversation, not checking through my email a hundred times. So this is really perfect. So I'm going to jump right on into the questions here. I have a lot of them. Um, so the first one that I, I wanted to ask is, which inequities do Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders face, and which of these challenges are maybe unique from those experienced by other races and ethnicities? Oh, such a good question. First off, the BIPOC communities, depending on who you ask, may or may not include Asian Americans. Um, obviously, Asian Americans do experience discrimination and all that stuff, but Some folks might consider them so white adjacent that they wonder whether or not they understand the inequities of other BIPOC communities. So that's one is that some groups have been pitted against one another. And so one of the unique aspects is this thing called the model minority myth that maybe this is a minority group that experiences certain privileges that others might not. And some of those may be reality based. If you look at who graduated college and who has a secondary uh, graduate degree after that. Some of that might be based in truth, but if you look at the whole of this community, there are such great disparities that that would be really unfair to cast. Um, so that's number one, model minority myth. The second one is they experience something called the forever foreigner kind of label. And it doesn't matter if I just got over here uh, within my lifetime or uh, my ancestors from four generations came to build the railroads, people might stop me on the streets and say, how did you get your English skills the way that they are? 
because they are seen as never quite belonging here. So those are two kind of really unique experiences to the Asian American and somewhat Pacific Islanders uh, experience. I've heard that um, anti-Asian violence has really increased since the start of COVID. Is that right? That is another unique aspect of this community that um, unfortunately since probably January of 2020, but if you look at some of the rhetoric prior to that, um, you'll see that we have not had very warm relations with China um, and that really impacted um, the communities when that was highlighted during COVID. Uh, throughout history, it's not been uncommon for Asian Americans to be scapegoated. So uh, bubonic plague led to the burning of Chinatowns. And um, we see very similar kind of reactions of people saying, let's distance ourselves and devalue this community. So um, that was one of the unfortunate byproducts of COVID. How do these challenges affect Asian Americans with regard to like mental health? Absolutely. Um, we have seen a spike in the anti-Asian racism. So they've been tracking through Stop Asian Hate, a, a portal that's been allowing folks to um, document their experiences throughout the pandemic. And I think last count, last time I did a media interview, it was at 11,000, which is just astounding, um, single mm. incidents of hate. And some of them have been fatal. Some of them have been nearly fatal. But even experiences of being spit on or um, last week I had, um, I was chased in an ethnic on oh my, God. <laughs> my friends and I were in an ethnic enclave that is primarily Asian. So even there, there's not true safety. Um, and so that does lead people to wonder about safety in the world and so on and so forth. And of course, that would lead to um, mental health concerns. Another unique challenge that Asian Americans face in respect to mental health are cultural and practical barriers. So practical barriers would be things like, I don't have transportation, I can't find childcare, and many groups experience things like that. The cultural barriers that are unique to Asian Americans tend to do with stigma and something about making our family lose space. So as an example, when Columbine happened, it was easy for folks to be like, wow, look at those youth and what they did. But when Virginia Tech happened, the president of a country that this person's family came from apologized on behalf of all Korean diaspora. So that level of shame, stigma, losing face and whatnot bears a lot of weight in terms of determining whether or not I should go seek treatment for myself, especially if it has a reflection on either my family or my people. So the cultural and practical barriers are rather unique to Asian Americans. I've heard before that there's a shortage of black psychologists. Is that true of Asian American as well? Unfortunately, we have a workforce shortage and it's particularly pronounced because of the high percentage of potential folks seeking treatment that could benefit from someone with language skills. So not just does this person look like me, can they speak my language is of a particular concern for this community. If you think about just the various dialects and uh, it just available in China alone, it's also very difficult to keep up with um, the other countries in Asia. And so it becomes a particular problem if you use children for language brokering. It can be very devastating to family dynamics. Um, and there's literature about this. They talk about the shift in family dynamics when a child suddenly adopts a, it's not a parentified role because they are still going to go listen to the parents telling them to do homework. But there is some power shifting that happens when you are translating for a credit card company or at the bank and certainly in healthcare. So 
a lot of unique challenges related to seeking health, mental health care. I'm not sure how culture plays into this. And of course, it would be so many cultures. Um, is there sort of a shortage of Asian Americans who are willing to seek help? Asian Americans tend to not seek help when they really need it. And when they do, it's usually far beyond when other groups might pull their alarm bells. So by the time they seek treatment, their symptoms are far more exacerbated and they've been around a lot longer than some other groups. So as an example, I had a patient come in with severe depression. She was accompanied by her sibling. And during the intake, I asked, oh, how long has she been catatonic and needed 24-7 monitoring between the three other adults in the household? Both parents and adult sibling would monitor her 24-7 so that she wouldn't harm herself. The sister said, 20 years. What? And I asked her, why didn't you bring her in sooner? She said, we didn't know anyone that could speak our language. It was very heartbreaking. A lot of what that family suffered for all those years could have been prevented. So the shame and stigma, the, the cultural barrier, the practical barrier, all that stuff combined with um, people possibly just not knowing because they immigrated and they don't have the right documentation or whatever to, to get connected with services. It can all kind of lead to this perfect storm of people being unseen. And unfortunately, that case, it's not like she didn't have a mental illness, but she was just simply not counted. So when we look at, wow, look at the statistics, Asian Americans don't have any problems. If you compare them, uh, not just depression, anxiety, and other serious mental illnesses, they look like they don't have any issues. Like, have we considered that we're undercounting? Have we considered that the, sh the stigma prevents people from accessing services. Mm -hmm. So it's really complicated. Um, but your question about, is there a shortage of psychologists? Yes. Is there a shortage of people seeking treatment? Yes. Is it because they don't need it? No, it's because they're either uninformed or there needs to be a stronger bridge to get them the services. I know I'm in the South. And so if someone were to tell a lot of people around here about climate change, they'd say that's baloney or whatever. But if they were to put a sign over the buffet that says, take all you want, but eat all you take. And it sounded like what grandma said, everybody's on board <laughs> with whatever it is. And so it made me wonder, is there any certain language that might be more or less effective at encouraging Asian Americans to seek mental health services when they need it? I love your question, Bradley, because it goes to show if you can be culturally aware, sensitive, responsive, all that kind of stuff, it can make a difference. So I used to work at the Asian Pacific Family Center of Pacific Clinics, and there we cater to uh, primarily Asian and Asian-speaking families. Um, we would have workshops for parenting groups saying, internet safety. Parents would not show up for that. Um, but if we wrote something like, Who's your kid talking to on the internet? Oh, they'd show up. So the language around how we enticed people was really important. This was also something that we found to be true. I sometimes take uh, either students or my colleagues to different parts of Asia, and we go touring through psychological services, social service agencies, and so on and so forth. We went to one of the largest hospitals in Beijing, and there they said that there was a new mental health department. And when they opened, they thought for sure they were going to be flooded because all the physicians were seeing all this stuff that related to mental health. And for some reason, they were twiddling their thumbs for the first few months. Then one day they realized no one's coming in because it says mental health clinic. But let's take down that sign and replace it with sleep disorder clinic. Oh my goodness, they were flooded. And they continue to be flooded because folks would say, I can point to a somatic concern. Maybe the root of it is something mental health-ish, but I'm not walking in through a door that says mental health. So the, the phrasing is for sure something that people are very sensitive to. Have you seen um, Pixar's Turning Red? 
Not yet. My students told me I have to watch it. So as soon as my semester's over, I feel like I'm going to be binging on all the excellent recommendations. Do they talk about that? Okay, so I've got a four-year-old, so I've seen it about 20 times. Oh my gosh. So maybe I'm picking it apart at this point. But I think it's this wonderful example of an adult trying to hide her emotions and her mental health. But, and it's a little bit of a spoiler, um, when she ultimately sort of loses control toward the end, the family really all steps in without question to help her and they don't judge her. And, and it's just such a positive message of someone getting the help that they need it all along. You're going to love the movie. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> can you name any other examples in pop culture or, or real life, wherever, of Asian Americans successfully receiving help when they need it? Okay. I'm oftentimes asked for a success story. If you actually try and Google Asian American celebrity mental health, not a whole lot of stuff pops up. Mm. There are some writings that I've seen about Asian celebrities. Like there was a Korean drama star that um, was found hanging in her hotel room that really made a huge sensational splash in international news. Um, there was a South Asian, I think she was a Bollywood star. She was young and beautiful and at 25, very similarly took her own life. So you can find stuff about Asian international stars and if you look up celebrities in America, mental health, you'll find Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, um, a lot of those names, but you won't see a lot of Asian American celebrities. Uh, I do know of some personally that are not shy about posting things, um, but they might, might be more local and regional kind of um, actors or comedians. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Not to say they're not out there. They're probably like held to some of the stuff that we talked about earlier. The stigma. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions to help Asian Americans select work and school environments that'll actually be supportive of their needs and their culture? You know, what's difficult is some of the institutions in which folks get promoted and things like that may not necessarily recognize the strengths of some of what the Asian American workforce bring. Um, and so therefore you see a phenomenon, what's called a bamboo ceiling. The bamboo ceiling basically says you're good enough to be a middle manager because you work very hard. You're excellent at details. I just don't see you having those soft people skills needed for managerial mm -hmm. positions. It may or may not be true, but there are some programs that help to break through that bamboo ceiling. So as an example, um, my brother works for Wells Fargo and I think they have something called LEAP. It stands for something and it's basically a leadership program for Asian American managerial track folks. So there are a few corporate kind of sectors that really recognize this bamboo ceiling phenomenon. So why did you choose to learn and later teach at CSPP? Mm. Well, I love CSPP because I was getting my master's at a predominantly white institution. I was having difficulty looking for mentoring for uh, the kind of research projects that interested me. And at the advisement of a very wise uh, peer mentor, he told me, why don't you look across the river? We were both studying together in Boston. So I had to go look for mentoring at Harvard Med School to find someone doing research with a population that I was truly interested in. We ended up doing a project on intimate partner violence with Chinese American women. And from that experience, I realized how important it was to find mentoring around the kind of topics and populations that I cared about. Aside from that, I was starting to look at mission statements of organizations that I wanted to align with because I realized having a gorgeous campus with a lot of resources that doesn't necessarily support your value system can be a slow kind of a death. So <laughs> I realized I needed to uh, impassion myself and surround myself with peers and mentors and really um, institutional backing to do the kind of work that I love. So as a result of that, I get to have a sexuality lab. And it was during a time when sex positivity was not that popular 
And so people would be walking by our lab going, what are they talking about in there? It sounds really lewd and lascivious. <laughs> but we ended up um, being able to create scales and present um, sexuality at a time where it was uh, kind of a taboo subject. Um, I also get to do things like uh, we have a multicultural community clinical psychology emphasis, this NCCP emphasis at the Los Angeles campus specifically works around social justice issues. So we've had um, occasion to bring in speakers, not just about anti-Asian racism, but Black Lives Matters, microaggressions, and we do very interesting programming to help impoverished communities. So I love that we really um, have affinity groups and colleagues that are like-minded working towards our mission statement. And then separately, I get to work with the Asian students on campus through our student affinity group. We have an Asian Pacific student network that I helped to co-found when I was a first year student. And I was pleasantly surprised when I came back as faculty that it was still going strong. So. We do very interesting programming, bringing in uh, performing artists that are interested in social justice issues. And that happened during COVID when people were scared to leave their homes. We had folks coming in and offering us comic relief, but still um, presenting their art form in a way that helped us to talk about the social ailments that we're experiencing. So for many reasons, I think CSPP has been a natural place for me to land. Um, and they also helped to launch um, what has become my international psychology hat. So I get to go to Asia and be a visiting professor at National Taiwan University because CSPP supported my sabbatical abroad. So I can't say enough good things about CSPP. <laughs> Since you just mentioned the classes that you've taught, I know they were kind of these controversial experiential courses. Um, when thinking about diversity related learning, do you have any suggestions for hands-on activities or projects that someone might put in their class or their workplace? I tend to teach classes that people love or hate. So take this with <laughs> a grain of salt. Um, I didn't create the course, but I fully believe in our intercultural processes and human diversity year-long mandatory course for all first-year doctoral level clinical psychology students. It has become the uh, nickname course, everyone's a racist. It, that's not how I tend to approach it, but just in dealing with examining one's own relative privilege or oppression in society, it brings up a lot of discomfort for folks. So naturally speaking, if we just read about it and discussed it, it's really easy to come back with defensiveness. But if you place people in immersive activities, such as the power walk, that one is found all over the internet, um, and there are ways to adapt it during COVID too. You can ask people to do very similar things in Zoom where they're exposing a vulnerability about themselves that they might not normally do in everyday life. Um, so power walks can be powerful. I've uh, written about modifications of activities that I've used for my own classroom purposes, such as I'll take Pamela Hayes' addressing model. And on the very first day of that course, I'll say, hey, you're going to interview one of your other classmates using this and maybe use this and think about the person that you interviewed, how you would feel if you had this person as your client or your therapist. Let's think about those kind of dynamics. So really asking people to apply the theories to what they imagine in their future uh, work as psychologists. Other kinds of activities that I do through uh, the other classes I teach are like in my spirituality and multicultural mental health. We might start off the semester having Shabbat with a female rabbi and her temple folks having a Q&A during a potluck afterwards. Uh, we did something very similar for our last day of class where we did a Native American sweat lodge and our guide and his family had a um, potluck waiting for us. Um, I also teach immersive Mm, they're kind of intense and they are field trip hybrid courses in Asia. So I've brought CSPP students over to China. Um, I brought them over to Taiwan and we're working on a class right now. It, it'll be flown for CE units to Korea 
where we tour hospitals, community health centers, social service agencies. And when my students actually see, oh, that thing that I talked about, the health, uh, the sleep clinic that had been renamed, they actually know to themselves, when I become a director of a clinic one day and I want to attract these kind of patients, I have to be very mindful about languaging. So I think immersive activities are the way to go. Um, I've written an article that's soon to be published, hopefully, about a shoebox exercise that I use where students do their own version of show and tell. And it's a very low stakes way of people self-disclosing on the first day, but that's oftentimes an activity that they'll refer back to. Like, you know, when Bradley showed his microphone that he had when he was age 12 because he was on Star Search and became a child celebrity, like those kind of things kind of stick with them. And so they're able to refer back to those kind of moments in the class. <laughs> Disclaimer, that's not me. <laughs> Okay, you seem like a natural in front of the microphone. Hi, <laughs> um, getting better. Okay. So I asked how should Asian Americans, um, what could they do to help choose good environments? I wondered if we could flip that question a little bit. If someone wanted to support Asian American mental health, like an employer or maybe a teacher, do you have any suggestions for things they might say or do? Or Asian Americans tend to put off getting mental health, even if they know that it's something really difficult to deal with or ignore. Um, one of the ways that I've successfully been able to engage folks is if someone in an authority figure strongly recommends, because one of the cultural values that Asian Americans might be influenced by is the respect for authority. So for sure, if your probation officer says it's mandatory, you're going to show up. Um, but even if a teacher says, this is something you might want to consider for your child, the chances of people actually making it to their first appointments is much higher. And then when I was director of a counseling center, we noticed that Asian American students tend to respond better with a warm handoff. So don't give them a business card of your university's caps and say, go to counseling and psychological services. They're going to treat you right. Why don't you pick up the phone and say, I have a student in front of me right now. We'd like to schedule an intake session together. Or even better, hey, I know that they have a crisis counselor who's always available for intake. Let's, let's walk over from my office. On the way over, let's just talk and walk. And then when you get over there, hi, this is my student. I just wanted them to see that this is a place. When you do that, it significantly increases their chances of showing up for that first appointment. So I guess these last couple of questions are the part of the interview where I try to backtrack a bit and address the problems I might have created along the way with those earlier questions. Um, so the first of those is I feel like I'm lumping a lot of people together, you know, from India to Hawaii, this, these aren't the same groups of people at all, into this one Asian American Pacific Islander group. Um, are there particular outliers or unique cultural considerations that you would like to share regarding mental health for certain groups? I love this question. I don't know how else to ask that question. <laughs> You, you asked it in the way that it was supposed to be asked because that's how complicated this community is. Um, one of the projects that I used to work on was within the state of California. It was called the California Reducing Disparities Project. And my job was to be a prevention uh, program director in the state of California for Asian American communities. And we would constantly talk about the need to disaggregate data specifically because of the reasons that you're mentioning. The first question that we talked about, what are some of the things that come up that are unique to this population? That model minority myth doesn't apply to everybody. And so if someone comes from a culture where that is endorsed in larger society, but that doesn't mirror my actual experience here, that can lead to a lot of problems. So um, that is part of the reason why Asian American Psychological Association, it's new, one of its newest divisions is the Southeast Asian Division. And one of the first divisions, um, wasn't the absolute first, but one of the first ethnic subgroup divisions of Asian American Psychological Association was South Asians. So even among Asian American Psychological Association, we recognize the need for these 
subgroups. These sub ethnicities have very specific needs. Um, and then having lived in Hawaii for over four years, I went there for internship and decided postdoc would not be bad there. Staff psychologist position wouldn't be awful either. Um, during that time, I had a great respect when I learned that some of the struggles and challenges our Native Hawaiian siblings experienced might actually be more parallel to the Native American experience of having your land displaced and uh, some of the social elements that come from that. I'm wondering, is it even ever fair to group such a diverse range of people together into the same category? Is this ever useful? Oh, yes and no. Yes and no. Because sometimes there are shared experiences where it might be helpful to advocate together. And that's similar to okay, Asian Americans might be part of a larger um, BIPOC oppressed communities. And sometimes we combine forces to talk about the U.S. census and how people are counted. And other times uh, when it becomes clear that we might have some unique experiences among our subgroups, then that whole argument about disaggregating our data becomes more paramount. So this is my last question. Uh, we've talked a lot about challenges faced by Asian Americans, a lot of negative situations. And I wondered, could we end off with strengths? Could you tell me some strengths of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders going right back to grouping them together, I guess, but, um, <laughs> but could you tell me some strengths that they should be proud of? Absolutely. Um, on a personal level, it's very easy to see why folks like my parents decided after 30, 40 ish years of life here in the US that they wanted to retire back in their home countries because elderly are so respected there. Um, so I think there are, are very um, tangible kind of benefits to some of the cultural values. Some of the others, it's interesting because the, the strengths could be strengths overdone. Um, but if I were just to say what works well, some of the collectivistic stuff of being able to share resources and be considerate of others and really think of the greater good, that is beautiful. Um, and one of the other things that I really think uh, we could learn from is being able to live in harmony with one another, as well as the elements. So um, this is, of course, a very East Asian kind of concept, but it can um, be seen throughout other parts of Asia. I just think some of what we are seeing today, not just today, Asian Pacific Heritage Month, just the past couple of years and so on and so forth. Some of the strife that we see in this world is because possibly we haven't learned to live in harmony with one another and share resources. So it is my hope that by highlighting Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we might be able to um, point to some of the things that they could improve upon and also highlight some of the things that we could all learn from. So thank you very much for that question. Wow, thank you. This has been such a special episode and it was really our first one to touch on this topic. And so I thought you did a really fantastic job with the questions and I feel like we have a great overview. We could have done a whole episode on any one of the questions. Um, but what a great place to start and kind of round up what are the challenges and what are the benefits and positives. And so I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, I want to thank you, Bradley, for being a very conscientious interviewer. And I want to thank SciKai for prioritizing this. I, of course, want to thank my own alma mater and institution that I teach at for supporting this series. And also to the listeners for taking the time out to learn about this group and if folks do have any ideas for some of the responses, I'd love to continue discussion because this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. As a board member of the Asian American Psychological Association, we're always trying to figure out how do we, um, of course, promote the needs within our own group, but also collaborate in some sort of a rainbow solidarity coalition with other groups. So thank you very much. Is there anything you can think of that maybe I've missed an important subject that we should touch on? You know, Asian Americans have been in the news um, lately, and some of it has been very um, concerning and dire. Folks have wondered, 
well, isn't this a good thing that they're gaining visibility? Um, one thing that I remember being really struck by a recent interview from one of my colleagues, um, Nellie Chan is the past president of Asian American Psychological Association. And she had said, we're not that visible still. Um, cause folks had said, Hey, isn't it great that y'all are getting airtime in the media? Um, but what's happened is that there are still, um, under reporting. So that 11,000 plus figure that I had mentioned is still considered an undercount in terms of the violence that's happening in our communities. Um, and folks are not able to really step up and speak out still when they see, um, some of the atrocities happening. So I would encourage Asian Americans to step up and speak out to be visible and heard and also our allies. I think there is a space for allies, even if it's very awkward, we don't know quite how to approach the subject. Um, my colleagues that talk about being able to heal from these racialized incidents is just to reach out. And so some of it might be kind of awkward, but it could be as simple as, Hey, I saw something on the news. It reminded me of you. Are you okay? I think the silence is more deafening than anything. And I remembered feeling very odd when the day after the Atlanta spa shootings, um, there was some silence in some of the spaces that I share with others. And some of those spaces were folks that really see themselves as social justice champions. So I know that it was not because of a lack of caring. I believe some of it was because there's just, how do you even approach a subject like this? So simply just checking in on folks and opening the conversation up and letting others know that you're open to it can be very healing for folks, even if they're not ready to go there. But it's especially true for um, a community that has learned about this collective shame due to a need for face saving. So I would encourage folks just to try and have a conversation with someone else. And I think as an ally, being able to open that door is very meaningful. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. This episode was made possible through a Psychi sponsorship with the Alliant International University California School of Professional Psychology. That's CSPP. Founded in 1969, CSPP was one of the nation's first independent schools of professional psychology. Today, CSPP continues its commitment to preparing the next generation of mental health professionals and advocates. Their dedication to ensuring every community's access to quality mental health care extends from integrated care to inclusive family therapy. Explore their programs at https colon slash slash discover dot alliant dot edu slash psychi slash home. There's also a link in the show notes for this episode. If you haven't already subscribed to Psych Everywhere, go ahead and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell a friend or a colleague about the show. Word of mouth is a huge help for podcasts. So share what you learned the next time you're catching up with an old friend or in your classes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Psychi Podcast and leave a review at Apple Podcast or wherever you go for podcast. You'll absolutely make my day and more importantly, you'll be helping us to get psych everywhere. Okay, that's all for now. I'll connect with you again soon. Copyright 2022, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.